Gregory Eaton, and this is All Saints Church in Austin, Texas. As I record this hymn video, some schools have begun teaching again uh, just this week. Others will be starting in the coming weeks. And I, so I thought we would start with a prayer for schools and colleges. Let us pray. O eternal God, bless all schools, colleges, and universities, especially as they seek to continue their mission in a time of pandemic, that they may remain lively centers for sound learning, new discovery, and the pursuit of wisdom, and grant that those who teach and those who learn may find you to be the source of all truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So in 2017, um, we were going through a period of, of racial tension, of a sense of injustice in the country, uh, and it really doesn't matter what the event was. Um, unfortunately, they're all the same, whether it's racism, sexism, homophobia, whether you put a name to it, such as uh, in the terms of racism, Emmett Till, Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner, George Floyd, or even all those that we don't know the names of, such as Billie Holiday uh, sang about in her song, Strange Fruit. Um, unfortunately, it's all the same story, and it all keeps repeating over and over and over. One would hope that we could learn, and that's one of the reasons that in 2017, I sent to the choir here at All Saints Church a list of hymns whose text I thought would be worthwhile for meditation and thought and prayer. All of the hymn videos I've been doing during this time of pandemic have been uh, hymns at the request of people in the congregation. And um, Four of the hymns in this video I was requested to do by one of the choir members who remembered that email from 2017. And so um, uh, those four and one other form the basis for this uh, video. We're going to begin with number 529 in the hymnal 1982, In Christ There Is No East or West. The text of this hymn is remarkable for its message of racial unity and equality, especially coming from someone who grew up in Imperial Britain. Now that may be because William Arthur Dunkerley, who uh, lived from 1852 to 1941, grew up in Manchester at a time when racial and economic inequality were major issues for that city, and they have remained so for decades and decades. Add to that his congregationalist upbringing, and you find someone who was ready to stand against the majority white Anglican colonial mindset. This text uh, harkens back to Jesus and to St. Paul in saying that there's no difference between any of us. There's no Jew nor Greek. There's no uh, free or slave. We are all one in God. And, and that means that justice and equality need to reign forth. Now, you may ask in my talking about this text, if you're looking at your hymnal, why am I talking about William Arthur Dunkerley instead of John Oxenham, which is who the hymnal says wrote the text? Well, in this day of social media, when there's such a, an effort to try and make ourselves famous, to make our names known, we might not remember that there was a time that people didn't necessarily want to be seen as pride, pride, prideful or arrogant in, in taking ownership of words. And so uh, Dunkerley often wrote under the pseudonym John Oxenham. So um, not only is this about justice, but it's by someone who was self-effacing enough that they, they thought, you know, I don't, I don't need to be famous for this. Um, I don't need to be thanked. I don't need to be criticized. So I'll just use a different name. The tune has an interesting history. Uh, according to a letter from Charles uh, Stanford to Samuel Coleridge Taylor, the uh, British African composer, McKee was originally an Irish tune taken to the United States and adapted by African-American slaves. 
it became associated with the spiritual, I know the angels done changed my name, which appeared in Marsha's um, uh, book, The Story of the Jubilee Singers with Their Songs in 1876. The arrangement of the tune in our hymnal is by Harry Burley, an African-American musician and musicologist from Erie, Pennsylvania. He grew up as a choir boy at St. Paul's Cathedral in Buffalo and is best known for arranging the music of African-Americans and bringing it into the mainstream of American music making. So here we have a mix of someone brought up in Imperial Victorian Britain who sees the problems of racial inequality. We have an Irish tune that became adopted by American slaves arranged by a British American composer and then further arranged by an African American composer. What better mix could you get to begin a video like this? So please join with Claudia Carroll singing and myself playing as we do hymn 529 in the hymnal 1982, In Christ There Is No East or West. Next, we turn to hymn 591 in the hymnal 1982, O God of Earth and Altar. Fans of the Father Brown mysteries may know of their author, G.K. Chesterton. What many do not know is that he was an early and very vocal critic of the racial superiority theories that were so popular at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. Those ideologies uh, would give rise to white supremacy and other ways of thinking that led to great danger, great loss of life, and a major war. His text, O God of Earth and Altar, was written in 1906 for the English hymnal and was subtitled Prayer for the Nation. Its very strong language, uncharacteristic for hymns, reminds us of all that we can and must do to improve our nation, whatever that nation may be, and our governance, so that all may be blessed by the God who loves all of creation. The tune, uh, called King's Lynn, is uh, an English tune of unknown origin. It was arranged by the great British composer Rafe Vaughan Williams, who I've discussed uh, in, in previous videos. It's an almost muscular tune, which drives home the strength of Chesterton's text and helps to underlie the cry of the oppressed for justice and harmony among all people. So please join with me now as I play and Claudia sings hymn 591, O God of Earth and Altar. And I invite you to sing, to pray, or to meditate on this text.
carrying on with my theme of, of people from England who grew up with the imperialist, colonialist mentality, and yet were able to overcome that by looking at and following the teachings of Jesus. We come to poet Rosamund Herklutz, who was born to British parents in Missouri, India in 1905. And, and her text, which is found at number 674 in the hymnal, um, is, is one that, that speaks of forgiveness. And it's not just the forgiveness that we get from God, it's our need to forgive others. We have, as I say, another product of British colonialism who understood the dangers of injustice and inequality. According to Ms. Herklutz, she wrote these words in 1966 after digging out weeds in her garden and thinking how bitterness, hatred, and resentment are like poisonous weeds growing in the Christian garden of life. Forgive Our Sins is a hymn about being ready to forgive others again and again, as Jesus said 70 times seven. We have many hymns about God's forgiveness of our sins, but this one adds a helpful reminder that we must also forgive other sins. The Tune Detroit was published in 1820 in a collection titled A Supplement to the Kentucky Harmony. The only information we have about the composer is the last name Bradshaw. This is firmly in the American shape note tradition, um, and uh, maybe I'll speak about shape note hymns in another video in depth. But um, what's interesting to me is that King's Lynn, that very British tune that we just heard in 591, and this tune all end, uh, both end with the same cadence. It's an illustration that uh, uh, my composer friend Richard Prue used to remark on uh, the fact that there are only 12 notes and they've all been used before. But this very strong, cadence really brings us into the end of, of both tunes. So please join with Claudia and me now as we do hymn number 674, Forgive Our Sins As We Forgive. have a hymnal, you can turn with me to number 582, um, O Holy City Scene of John. Now I've been harping on Imperial Britain, and uh, but it wasn't just Imperial Britain that has inspired change of heart. Virginian Walter Russell Boy was born in 1882, 
and lived in a South trying to undo the end of slavery by writing laws which would deny the vote and other rights to people of color, what eventually became known as Jim Crow. However, the teachings of Jesus clearly had an impact on Boy, who would go on to become an Episcopal priest and a professor at the Virginia Theological Seminary. This text is an expansion of important ideas, um, uh, one of which is found in the third verse of America the Beautiful, the shining city of God, full of justice and equality, as opposed to the tarnished societies built on earth. And yet this text urges us to begin building that shining city here and now. So yes, there is all this about how, how bad things can be on earth, but there is that promise of God's kingdom and the call to us to be the ones to build that. The tune Sancta Civitas is by Herbert Howells. Uh, again, I've spoken of him before, a very important 20th century British composer. Uh, he had lots of jazz influenced harmonies. This may not be one of the most familiar tunes um, I've done in, in these hymn videos. What I think is interesting about the tune is that each of the three phrases begins with the same six note figure. That's how the first phrase begins. Second phrase begins. And then the final phrase takes it up. So that is the sense of unity uh, that, that uh, Howells uses for this tune. Because it may not be familiar, I'm going to play through it for you before we actually do it with Claudia. And here's what it sounds like. Tears shall be wiped from the eyes of those who've cried in this life. I think together this text and tune have been recognized by many critics as among the greatest contributions to hymnody of the 20th century. The preface to the book Hymns of the Kingdom of God in 1910 said, we have been led to believe that as the kingdom was the burden of our Lord's message, it should be the burden of his church's prayer and praise. And here the word burden does not mean something we carry. The, the word burden is, is the same as refrain. It, the kingdom should be the common refrain of the church's prayer and praise. This hymn is definitely a call to be part of the kingdom now and forever. So please join with me and with Claudia now as we do hymn number 582, O Holy City, Scene of John.
All right. There's been a lot of sort of dark hymns to, uh, in this video about sin, about the, the problems of life on earth. But now that we've sung about equality and justice, we've asked for the forgiveness of our sins and called for the building of the perfect kingdom of God here on a sinful earth, what should be our ongoing response? Well, according to Mary Ann Thompson, we should go forth and publish glad tidings, as we see in hymn 539 in the hymnal. Thompson was born in the UK in 1834, but spent most of her life in the United States where she was librarian of the Free Library in Philadelphia. She died in 1923. Just as we are called to witness God's love in difficult times, she was moved to begin writing these joyful words of hope and promise after a night of sitting up with a sick, a sick child in 1868. Imagine that, sitting up with a sick child and then getting up to write these words about publishing glad tidings. Interestingly enough, um, she felt that the text was incomplete, and it wasn't until three years later in 1871 that she came up with the refrain, publish glad tidings, tidings of peace, uh, and completed the text. The tune was written in 1875, but was written for a different set of words. It was written for the text, hark, hark, my soul, angelic songs are swelling. The composer was the British organist James Walsh, or, or Walk, I don't know how it's pronounced exactly, born in England in, in uh, 1837, and he died in Wales in 1901. The music is strongly influenced by American gospel hymns of the time, and we know that the, the gospel hymn writing pair Moody and Sankey from the US had uh, toured England uh, just prior to uh, this tune's being written, and, and there, there was a huge outpouring of British composers writing hymns in that style. Though written for a different set of words, the tune has become so irrevocably tied with Thompson's words that the tune name was changed to Tidings. This hymn has appeared in every Episcopal hymnal since the 1892 edition. And I think it's a fitting way to close today's hymn video to publish glad tidings that even though we live in an unjust world, we are called to the kingdom. Jesus provides the example and we are to follow. And if we do that, we can bring God's justice here on earth to the holy city scene of John. So let's join now and sing hymn 539 publish glad tidings.